Judge Eileen Cannon can't stay in her lane and instead colors outside the lines to send the DOJ back to the drawing board on its efforts to keep their 84 top witnesses secret from the public until trial, while granting the DOJ's motion to set a conference to discuss continuance and classified documents procedures. And co-defendant Walt Nauta struggles to get to Florida again for his arraignment and to find local counsel. Back in New York, a setback for the New York Attorney General civil fraud case against the Trump family set for October as an appellate court rules for Ivanka and dismisses her from the case. Not because she didn't commit the fraud, but because the Attorney General was late just slightly in filing the case against her and other large transactions that are a part of the $250 million disgorgement case may also have to be dismissed before trial. We'll talk about that. Speaking of off the rails, Trump and his lawyer of choice for harebrained filings, Alina Haba, have retained have retaliated against E. Jean Carroll, whom a New York jury already found he sexually abused in 1996, awarding her $5 million, by filing their own defamation case because she uses the word rape to describe what happened to her, not sexual abuse. I posit whether Donald Trump's reputation can ever be defamed, and what's the damages he could have suffered between abuser and rapist? All this and so much more, it's like beyond Bed Bath & Beyond. On this week's midweek edition of Legal AF with your usual lineup of anchors, Michael Popak and Karen friedman Ignifolo. Karen, you're in New York. I'm in sort of New York. How are you? Good. It's good to be home finally and just being able to do this from home. (laughs) We were joking before the show, so but I think people like to hear us joke before the show, about sometimes when people just tune into our show for the first time, and it's hard to believe we've been on the air for two and a half years, and there are first-time people, welcome, first-time people to the audience, and sometimes they don't get what the, sh- what the show is or who the anchors are, and then Ben and I do it on Saturday, and sometimes they think I'm the guest and you're the host, or you're the host and I'm the guest, or Ben, and you know we get, we get criticized, let the guest speak more, or the host is... But, but, we're both anchors. (laughs) And that's what makes this show, this propels the show, I think, every week uh, in in the right direction. So I'm really glad that you are my co-anchor, you are my colleague, you are my friend. Here we are. And now it's time to talk about all things uh, Eileen Cannon, the judge that we all are white knuckling over, her every move, her every docket entry. It's hard to believe that it's only been less than three weeks from an indictment. We're already up to docket entry number 45 in the case. And we've got a ruling, and I want to talk to you more about it. We got a few rulings that have all kind of got spit fired out by Judge Cannon recently. The first is, and I'm not, I might take a different position here. Her first ruling about the unopposed motion by the government to both file their top 84 witnesses as part of the special condition that the magistrate judge had set, Judge. Uh, Uh, Judge uh, Goodman actually had set in the case where Judge Goodman said, you know, I'm going to set one special condition of release from arrest and arraignment of Donald Trump. He shouldn't talk to witnesses identified by the government. I'm summarizing, Um, except about things not related to the case. So I'm going to set that special condition and I'm going to let the Department of Justice develop their own list and then they can give it to the other side. Follow, follow me here. They can give it to the other side, and that's the list that Donald Trump will have to abide by and not talk to about the case itself. Okay, seemed pretty ordinary. Department of Justice hadn't asked for that special condition, but they got it by way of the magistrate judge. And then about a week or so later, they developed their list of 84 potential top witnesses. Not all the witnesses they're going to use at trial, they said in a footnote, but the top 84. Okay. I would have thought they would have just sent that over to Chris Keis and Todd Blanche for Trump side and Nauda for his lawyer, Stanley uh, Woodward. And that would be at the end of it. For some reason, the Department of Justice decided that in order to sort of comply with the special condition, they needed to file the 84 names on the docket. And here's where the tension comes in. Things are supposed to be public and available to the public, both for you and I and Ben to talk about on Legal AF on Midas Touch Network, and just in general, because the public's right to know about our justice system is very important, as important as the rights of the other parties to the actual prosecution or litigation. The public is a party, if you will, to all of the proceedings because 
we we have to know what's going on. Otherwise, we're living in a society or in a country where we have secret trials and you find and people get sent to gulags. We don't want that. So the media will often intervene and remind the court and the parties that the public has a place at the table and ask to have everything produced. Now, there's that tension. Some things are like classified, top secret national security. Maybe that needs to be sealed or redacted. Or for a time period, things need to be protected from prying eyes of the public and articles, media, hot, hot takes and podcasts, but not forever. And so even as an example, when the, when the uh, Department of Justice filed last August with the then magistrate judge, Judge Reinhardt, the application for the search warrant of Mar-a-Lago and, and had affidavits and all of that, eventually a redacted black line version of that document got released. Not immediately, but at some relatively soon time, and certain blackouts were there, um, you know, for things that needed to still be protected. But the bulk of the document was there, so people get a sense of what's going on. That is the general approach, and so I am not. I was not flabbergasted by Cannon saying, "Okay." You filed a two-page motion, Department of Justice, signed by Jay Bratt, the head of the counterintelligence uh, department of, of the DOJ. It's unopposed. I get it. The other side's not opposing this particular relief. But I got all the media that's intervened in the case or trying to intervene um, in order to get whatever you're about to file. And I have a few questions for you. This is how she put it in the order. Salty, can we put the order back up? All right. So she said... A, I don't know why you need to file this. Why can't you, in other words, why can't you just give it to the other side? Who told you to file it? And if you're going to file it, show me a particularized need. That's a term of art. Give me the basis for the entire document from now on through trial to be sealed and, and uh, not available to the public. Why can't you redact it? Why can't you redact certain parts of it? Why can't you do a partial sealing? And why can't you address any of that in another motion? So I'm going to bounce this one. DOJ, come back to me with a renewed motion because she dismissed it without prejudice, which happens, and file it again. Try to make either come back to me and say, we withdraw our request. We're not going to file it at all. We're just going to give it to the to the lawyers. And if there's a problem, like they violate it, we'll come back to you, Judge, which is what I think. And I want to hear from you, Karen, what the Department of Justice may do. Or they're going to say, nope, here's the particularized need and it should stay locked away all the way through trial. And here's case law that supports it. So that is the order issue. Then she said, Motion for motion for status conference under SIPA, the conf, you know the uh, the law that gu the guards over top secret. I'll do that. I'll do that in July, like the fourteenth, because there's a holiday. And the other side, you guys give me your opposition to a, a motion for continuance. Tell me when you want the trial, and we'll get together sometime in July, and we'll talk about that. So the the government's motion for that is granted. And in the meantime, Walt, now to get your act together, you don't have a lawyer. You missed your plane for the arraignment. Uh, we'll do the arraignment again another day. Get a lawyer. Get a life. Get a lawyer. And then the we have this question that you and I've never talked about. We'll do it now, Karen. Is are these cases going to be tried together? Is this going to be U.S. versus now to Trump in one case, or is somebody going to make a motion to sever or to consolidate? How do you think this is going to be tried? We never really talk about those things. Okay, that's my frame. You you did some hot takes with on this stuff. Really interesting with Ben. Start with the order, then go to the status conference, and then we'll end with how do you think this case gets tried. Judge Cannon uh, did this order that was not uh, written, but it appeared written in the docket uh, where the one that you just put up there um, that spelled out the question about this witness list. And, and I think you're right. It is a little bit of a head scratcher, but let's, let's unpack it a little bit and, and back up. Okay. In a normal criminal trial, the prosecution doesn't have to turn over their witness list until way down the line, right? Much closer to trial, mostly because half the time they don't know exactly who their witnesses are going to be at trial, who they're going to call, what order, but also because, uh, because you don't want any interference. You don't want any witness intimidation. You don't want to necessarily uh, give the defense an opportunity to, to do anything to cause the witnesses to not want to come forward, et cetera. And so 
Jack Smith had no intention of giving the witness list over right away. Um, we see, you know what, you see what Trump does to the witnesses. You see what, what he does to, you know, hit, not just him, but, but all of the MAGA, um, crazy people who go out and, you know, intimidate and threaten. I mean, look at Shay, you know, Shay Moss and Ruby Freeman, you know, what happened to, to their lives? Their lives were destroyed because their names were out there. You know, Trump is a name calling bully and he, and he foments uh, incredible amount of violence and dissent. And so if I were the prosecutor, the way I'd be thinking about it is, okay, I don't want those, I don't want those names out there. Certainly not for me, because if something happens, I don't want to be the cause of it. You know, they can surmise that someone might be a witness. They'll get some discovery that they might know. I'd probably redact some names, but I'm not going to be the cause of somebody's life being ruined because, uh, because I gave a name over. That's how I would think of it as a prosecutor. But like, so Jack Smith goes to arraignment and he decides not to ask for any conditions of release at all. And surprisingly, the magistrate judge on his own, without anybody asking, says, you know what, I'm going to protect the integrity of these proceedings, even though Jack Smith and DOJ, you're not asking for this. And even though um, Donald Trump, you're not asking for this, I want to protect the witnesses here. Uh, so I'm going to have you s not hand over a witness list, but I want a list of all the people that Trump should not have contact with. Okay. So in some ways he's making the point that these, that Trump and his people are a bunch of, um, harassing, threatening individuals. And he wants his own list of people who, that, who, who, um, who the DOJ would say have to be protected from Trump, frankly. And I think the DOJ was a little bit concerned, like, you know, we didn't want to turn this over, you know, because now, yeah, you're telling them not to have any contact, but in some ways you're giving them a roadmap. You know, you're giving them a roadmap of who to have your people threaten, you know, your, your army, uh, your MAGA army of, of, you know, insurrectionists. And so, but so if I'm Jack Smith, I'm like, okay, well, I've been ordered to do this by a magistrate judge. So it's a court order. Therefore, I feel I have to, in order to comply with it, I have to file it with the court. But I'm going to ask that there be a protective order, right? Essentially, because as, as you said, you know, the, um, the press often will make motions uh, seeking access to sealed information or sealed courtrooms. And why is that? It's, it's because, you know, both the First Amendment guarantees the right of a free press and the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right of the Constitution, the right of uh, defendants' right to an open and public trial. And together, putting those together, the, the press will has just as much of a right to be in a courtroom as anybody else. And, and I've had, I've had to be on the other side of, of, um, press motions, uh, where they want to seek access to information in closed courtrooms. And there's very limited times that you can seal something or close a courtroom. And to do that, you have to make a particularized showing and a particular of a particularized need for it and a right to do it. And I think, um, I think, you know, the DOJ and Jack Smith, they just assumed because this was a court ordered thing that we didn't even ask for. And he got the consent of Trump's lawyers. I don't know how he could get the consent of Nada's lawyers because he doesn't have a lawyer who's licensed to practice in Florida, but it was unopposed. And so I think they just assumed because it's unopposed, they can just sail it through and, and file it under seal and the judge would agree. Well, the judge said, no, not so fast. You know, I also have a motion pending before me from various news organizations who are making these First Amendment and Sixth Amendment uh, arguments, and they have a right to this information unless you follow the law and show that there's a particularized need for this for some reason. And it's just, you just have to give a reason under the law. You have to you know, the protective orders are generally given if you can throw, show that, you know, there's a risk that, that, that there's privacy issues or, or safety issues or, or other reasons, you know, you just have to give them. And, and, and Jack Smith, you know, he didn't do it here. I think they just thought that it would be okay because it was unopposed. But I, but Eileen Cannon is, you know, trying to go by the letter of the law here, but at least she did it in a way that was, um, 
that was without prejudice to give them an opportunity to file something. So I think what's going to happen next is we're going to see a filing or we're going to see that there is a filing. I don't know if we'll get to see it. Um, I don't know if it'll be under seal or not about um, why they need this, this list of what essentially turns out to be a witness list, even though it's a no contact list, it's essentially a witness list. Why can't they question? She leads off with, why do you even need to file this? Why didn't you just send it over to the other side? Why don't you think the government now reverse, doesn't just reverse course and say, got it, here's the list, uh, Blanche. They're already under a protective order about the contact and let them hang themselves if having gotten the list, Donald Trump screws it up. Why? She's right. I mean, I hate to say, the words she's right and canon are mm -hmm. very difficult for us, yeah. but, I, but I'm going to call it as I see it, right? I didn't think this was a bad order. I thought actually, as you said, them trying to slide it through on a two pager, it isn't an easy call. It Correct. wasn't supported properly in two pages. And I don't understand why they need the whole list from now until the trial to be protected. If I were them, and I wanna hear your opinion, why not just send it to the other side, forget the whole filing thing, and the media can't fight for it if you're only sending it between parties because you know they only have an interest in docketed things, things on the public docket. Why would you just send, my question to you is, as, a, as a now prosecutor, thinking like Jay Brad and, and the lawyers for Jack Smith, why not just say, oh, screw it, we'll just send it to them? Look, they might, they might, but the reason they're probably not doing it is two reasons. Number one, since this was an, an, a court order, right? This was an order of the magistrate, you have to somehow show that you are, um, in compliance with this, right? And how can the how can the magistrate order uh, order that order someone to not have contact with individuals if the magistrate doesn't or the judge the court doesn't know who those individuals are? So I kind of think it's that's you know he. I think that's part of the order you need to otherwise it's not enforceable and it's not really discovery right this is and only the discovery is what was ordered to be you know ha has a protective order under it right not every communication between parties is under this protective order just the discovery and this isn't really discovery this is really in compliance with a court order so i think that's why they were doing it that way uh, because they really don't want this to be public and that's the only way to ensure it mm -hmm. other than you know so that that's why i think they were doing it that way yeah i i probably there is an artful way to do it but again this is how many angels are dancing on the head of a pen you could file a one pager that says we have complied with the special conditions set by the magistrate judge we have supplied the other side with a list of 84 names and um should there be a violation of it we'll file something in camera to tell you which of the 84 have been improperly uh, contacted pursuant to the special condition and then the magistrate can say you know what i want to see the names and then it's an order you know, I was surprised she jumped in and didn't let uh, Goodman handle it because it was his order, or at least Reinhardt, the other magistrate. But, you know, that's, again, inside baseball stuff. I'm not sure at the end of the day it matters. You may be right. They'll just file the motion. They'll just file the 84, um, ask for, a, they'll make the particular eye showing as to why they need it for the period of time that they need it. And then the other side will brief it, and then we'll, we'll sort of decide. What do you think about the... Um, the uh, the other order related to the setting of the pretrial conference that you know the date of it keeping things sort of on track and then i want to talk about whether you think now to trump or tried in the same case or not yeah so you know look they she i think she's trying to keep this moving right she's trying to keep it moving quickly so the first pretrial conference was set for july 14th to so, to focus on the sepa classified information procedures act procedures and you know just what that is means that uh, there's a statute that was passed in the 1980s um, that basically talks about how to deal with classified information uh, during a criminal trial. Because when you try someone, typically every, it's as we just discussed, it's an open courtroom and it's a public courtroom. And so, for example, all court exhibits are public record. And so anyone has access to them, anyone can see them. And obviously, it's a problem if that information is classified. So SEPA, the Classified Information Procedures Act was passed in the 1980s, to try to protect the government against what they call gray mail, which is different. It's not quite blackmail, right? It's gray mail. Um, in national security cases, which is what, what gray mail was, was a tactic where the defense 
defense, you know, defense attorneys and defendants would threaten to reveal classified information at trial, uh, saying, you know, saying we go to trial, I want this, these documents in as evidence, betting that the government would prefer to drop the charges rather than risk disclosure. So really what SEPA requires is the defense to disclose which documents they want to use at trial in advance. So the courts can decide whether or not to put any restrictions on them. So, you know, and if the government feels that uh, the restrictions are not enough, they can decide whether they still want to continue with the case or with that charge. And the first step under SEPA is for a judge to schedule a hearing with the prosecutors and defense lawyers, which is what she has done here. And then they will speak start to establish a timetable for discovery of the materials and how to how the defense will be able to use them at trial. Now, if you remember uh, when they executed the search warrant, they recovered over a hundred classified documents, right? But Donald Trump and Walt Nata, you know, well, Donald Trump is only charged with possessing 31 of those documents. So what that says to me is that Jack Smith already in, consul in consultation with national security officials has already uh, gone through the hundred and something classified documents and said, okay, you know, the nuclear codes, that's way too secret. I'm, I'm making that up. I don't know if there were nu nuclear codes, but whatever, whatever the most, you know, absolutely super secret national security document that that was there said you know what there's no way even the existence of this document would put people's lives at risk let alone the document itself being um, put out there so we're not going to charge that one because no sepa procedure could guard against uh and protect against you know making that information public i don't want defense lawyers seeing it you know whatever so i'm sure there's there's the extremely extremely sensitive documents were taken out of the of the um of out of the mix and then you know which ones do you want to you want to do you want to include in there and we'll see i would also guess they would be ones that are most obvious you know the ones in the bright red the bright red envelope and the ones in the you know that weren't just you know mixed in with other things that were in like a section called classified or whatever i you know the most obvious so that you can show that the possession was intentional it wasn't accidental right he knew he had it it was in with you know certain other things etc and they narrowed it down to 31 documents and so you know i think that 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 procedure has already started on the part of the government they're already betting that okay if the even if the judge uh, allows these to be used at trial in some form or fashion, it's okay. And I'm sure Jack Smith has cleared that with the national security people. The concern I have, the thing that I think is going to happen at the hearing is I think the defense is going to talk about, okay, I want to talk about the 70 something other documents at trial, because that's part of my defense, you know, whatever their defense is. Our defense is this was accidental and in inadvertent. So I need access to all of the classified materials that were recovered, not just the 31 Jack Smith has chosen. And, and it's that's where the fight's going to be, right? I think over all of that. Um, and we'll see where Judge Cannon rules during the hearing. You know, she has to put a procedure in place that balances the needs of a public trial and a defendant, uh, a defendant's due process rights at trial, as well as the need uh, to protect national security. So it'll be very interesting to see if, you know, how she rules. I mean, we're not going to know, obviously, but what we will know because it's secret, it's classified, is if the government disagrees with her ruling, they have a right to appeal and to go to the 11th Circuit. Uh, whereas Trump does not. And then to answer your final question, um, w will Trump and Nada be uh, tried together? And the answer is 100% yes. I don't see this in any way. Uh, you know, right now they are joined. They were indicted together. So it would have to be a motion to, se to sever. And one of them would have to make that motion to sever. And the standard for severance is um, is kind of a high bar. And it's you have to show that you have antagonistic or inconsistent defenses. It's not enough to even have different defenses. You know, you have to have ones that are antagonistic or inconsistent. So in this particular case, if Nada were to say, you know, Trump did it, it's all Trump, you know, he made me do it kind of thing. Um, I guess, yes, it could be, they could be severed, but I think short of that, they're going together. What do you think on that? Yeah, I think that uh, that framework that you just laid out is the right one. Um, I could see where things could get antagonistic between the two of them. There were some phony 
tweets and social media truths that went out today for Donald Trump that looked like he was throwing Walt Nauta under the bus. But we all, you know, careful eyes spotted that that was a phony thing. But that could really happen. Somebody could be throwing somebody under the bus as we get closer to trial. I know the government still holds out hope, I'm sure, that Walt Nauta will be their key lead witness, along with Evan Corcoran, the former lawyer, or current lawyer, depending upon who you listen to, um, for Donald Trump. Um, they would love to have Nauta. That would be the final nail. There's so many nails in the coffin. I don't know which one could be designated the final nail, but I think Walt Nauta would be. And I think by, uh, you know, he's not having an easy go of it right now. His boss is probably not thrilled with him. Um, he now knows that both his grand jury testimony, which I'm sure he perjured himself during, has been contradicted by audio, video, and other testimony um, that they have. And so he's in the crosshairs and he's going to lose his own case on his couple of counts. And to cut a deal, listen, you know, there's other jobs out there. There's other careers out there. He's a 30-year-old or whatever he is, 40-year-old guy. He's never going to be president of the United States. And he better be every man for himself. So I think if that happens, then there's no trial of Walt Nauta. There's a there's testimony of Walt Nauta and no trial. But um, you know, for right now, you know, Donald Trump's going to keep his enemies, his friends close and his enemies closer. And you're right. I think this case gets tried together and the hurdle to reach won't be met in order to sever. But you, you see these things and there's, there's pundits on the internet. They're like, oh, look, they're talking about the West Palm Beach courthouse, or maybe it's the Miami courthouse, or maybe it's in Fort, Fort Pearson. For now, to, it's all right, just everybody relax. The decision as to which courthouse it's going to be in has not been made for either of these two gentlemen. The fact that a hearing here, an arraignment there is going to be held at some convenient location, either with a duty magistrate or the regular magistrate or the regular judge, it doesn't matter. It, and for us to continue to read tea leaves, it's really a wasted exercise. It doesn't mean a thing. We'll, we'll know soon enough. I mean, when the trial is set the one of the issues I'm sure that Judge Cannon will raise with the DOJ and with Trump's lawyers is, where do you want this? Now, we know what Trump's position is going to be. He wants it in Fort Pierce because the counties of the, the areas around Fort Pierce that would from which a jury would be pulled or some of the rubiest red districts around. He won the surround Trump won the surrounding area around Fort Pierce. He won, he won Florida, but he also won these areas. And so within the Southern District, which gets progressively more Democrat as you travel south in the district, and then Miami's its own thing, uh, but still, still a couple of points Democrat favor. He wants a red jury pool for Pierce. West Palm is a little bit more Democrat. For Lauderdale's terrible for him. It's very heavily Democrat. And Miami's a pick em, but leans, leans slightly to the Democratic side. So you know where he wants it. And you know where the government wants it. The government wants it at Miami, Fort Lauderdale, or West Palm Beach. And it can be in any one of those courthouses. Cannon, in consultation with the Chief Judge Altanaga, will ultimately make that decision. And then we'll, we'll, go, we'll go from there. So there's, there's one, there's one sure. thing I just want to say about that. Number one, yeah. well, two things. Number one, where the the courthouse where this ultimately goes has to have a skiff, um, you know, a, a secure. Um, what does skiff stand for? A secure whatever information it's facility, you know, compartmentalized. You know, yes, exactly. One, a, one. <laughs> one of those super secret places that yeah. have no in that, that you can view classified information that can't be bugged. Right. It can't be, you know, so I don't know which courthouse has a skiff. My, but- Miami has a skiff nearby. It okay. Has a so rent, that's a rent to skiff. I don't think I don't, I haven't seen reporting and I'm not aware of it, even though I practice down there because I don't do national security work that way, that there's a skiff in Fort Lauderdale or West Palm. And I know there's not a skiff in, in Fort Pierce. So I think that's going to be uh, a yeah. factor number one. And then f- the other thing I just want to mention is in other jurisdictions, and I don't know how they do it in Florida, when you do have to have a trial in a different courthouse, they will bus jurors from the proper place. Ah. So that's typically how it's done. So if Mar-a-Lago is physically located in West Palm Beach, it's in then, Palm Beach, but it's next to West Palm. Okay, wherever the jurors were supposed yeah. to come from, West Palm that's, Beach. Where, mm-hmm. that's where they're probably, again, if they do it the way they do it in other jurisdictions, they will bus mm-hmm. those jurors uh, to wherever the courthouse is. Bus, busing in Florida for Trump. That that has so many levels of, of special delight. And it would be great because if they get stuck with Fort Pierce jurors, 
Um, you and I and Ben are going to be having a lot of, um, oh my God, moments of trying to get a unanimous jury to convict Donald Trump in a place where people think he walks on water. Um, and there are still places like that in the country, as we know. Um, and then we've got, let's just touch on this because it's new reporting today. We've got uh, Rudy Giuliani, who, speaking of every man for himself, knowing that he's in the crosshairs and having parts of his anatomy squeezed in places like Georgia with um, Fonnie Willis and the, interlec- the election interference there, his role in the fake elector scandal and scheme, and in the lawsuits all around the country that were failed and failing um, in every way, shape, and form, has now um, made it, it looks like he's making an arrangement to come in and have a conversation, which we call a proffer, with the uh, Jack Smith's special uh, prosecutors about Jan 6, which would mean the Willard Hotel, the headquarters for the Jan 6, and the, and the insurrection and the uh, clinging to power by Donald Trump and all of that. And if he's met it, if they already have a formal agreement here, it's reporting that he doesn't have the formal cooperation agreement yet. This is a precursor to that, much the way we've heard recent witnesses come in um, and talk like uh, the uh, the two people that were responsible on the ground for the fake elector scheme have already gone in and are working on a deal. Now, if the deal that they're working on, there's really two types of immunity. We've talked about it in other hot takes and podcasts before. There's uh, use immunity, and then there's just sort of full immunity. Uh, the question is what, what, how much Donald, how much Rudy Giuliani's testimony is important at this point to Jack Smith, probably, and then how much he's willing to give him immunity. Queen for a day immunity, ironic for. Giuliani, is you come in, you tell us the truth. And as long as you tell us the truth, whatever you tell us can't be used against you. If we develop that same evidence independently, we're using it against you. But what you tell us, you are a queen for the day. You can tell us whatever you like, as long as you don't lie to us while you do it, because then you'll be committing another crime. So that's limited or use uh, or uh, use immunity. And then there's the other fuller transactional immunity. We don't know which one, but, we, but it's a bad sign for Donald Trump. And as Ben likes to say, a great day for liberty and justice that Rudy Giuliani is coming in from the cold and maybe talking to the lead prosecutor to avoid his own you know, backside being uh, incarcerated. What do you think about that, uh, Karen? I don't know. I mean, Rudy Giuliani, first of all, you have to tell the truth. And I don't think he's capable of telling the truth. And he's committed so many crimes. He'd have to go in. If he was going to cooperate, you have to you have to admit to all the crimes you've committed. And he's going to go in and plead guilty. I don't see it. I think this is, I mean, who knows? But I would to me, this is a this is a play to try. He knows that Fonnie Willis is breathing down his neck. And next month, which is in a few days, she's gonna start, uh, she's gonna start um uh, her, you know, grand jury proceedings. I, I think she's going to bring indictments in the next month, right? Everyone's been reporting on that. It's either in July or August, which is in a, yeah. you know, which is coming up. Beginning and so, of August, yeah. exactly. And he knows he is uh, a target there, and he is about to be indicted. And so, I think this is a play to try to get her off of him, right? Because he doesn't, because don't forget, um, if he gets charged in the state and then convicted in the state, he can't be pardoned for that. So he wants to somehow get himself to, uh, to, um, in the, in the grips of Jack Smith and get Jack Smith to say to Fonnie Willis, Hey, you know what? Don't, don't do Rudy. We're in the process of seeing if we can get him to cooperate, you know? So I don't want him to be under indictment while he's potentially, cause then he can't talk to me. Right. So, uh, I don't want him to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be in that situation. So I think this is Giuliani's way of trying to, um, stall or get Fonnie Willis not to indict him. But I cannot imagine uh, that that he would in any way um, ever ultimately reach a cooperation agreement with them because they're not going to give him immunity. Uh, no way will they. genetically him. incapable of telling exactly. the truth, which is, exactly. which is right, he's congenitally a liar. Exactly. Um, agreed. Agreed. And I agree. And I think, I think you're right. You can see how things are heating up. You know, Brad Raffensperger, Raffensperger for people that that are waiting for me to do the p p p well, We know there's a P in the middle. Sometimes it sounds like a P. We know it's a P. But with Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State, um, who was on the phone call in search of the 11,758 votes just between us so I can be President of the United States, pretty pleased phone call. He's gone in 
and he is he's he's struck a deal or he, he's going to testify he doesn't need to strike a deal he'll testify and he's cooperating with uh with um jack smith and i'm sure rudy giuliani knew that and said holy cow this train is leaving the station i better i better jump on or i'm going to be under the wheels of it so we're going to follow it uh you know karen me and ben we do hot takes all the time to bring up in real time things that are happening i think i'm going to do one on raffensperger soon and coming up on this long form podcast that everybody looks forward to it midweek we're going to talk about the retaliatory strike late night strike by donald trump trying to go after E. Jean Carroll for defamation because he's not a rapist. He's a sex abuser. Okay. Um, we'll talk about the merits of that and Alina Haba having filed it and what that's all about. And, and then we'll talk about what happened. Why is Ivanka Trump now dismissed from the case? And, and uh, why didn't the attorney general file that case more timely against her or get a longer agreement to give her more time to file the case against her? We'll talk about tolling agreements and why they're important to a prosecutor and to an investigate investigator with a former prosecutor and investigator, Karen Freeman McNifolo, um, and why even long statute of limitations of five years and six years may not be long enough in a very complicated investigation. And we'll talk about what the impact would be on the New York attorney general's a $250 million disgorgement case if some of the transactions that make up that case are time barred if they're outside that statute of limitations. We'll do it next, but first a word from our sponsors. And now let's take a quick break to talk about our next partner, Lomi. Now I've never been able to compost before. It was always too complicated, too much work, and frankly, I don't think I even knew exactly if I was doing it right. Then I got a Lomi. Lomi allows me to turn my food scraps into dirt with just the push of a button. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns scraps to dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs, and it's really quiet. Thanks to Lomi, I have way less garbage each week. My family, we're down from three bags per week to just one. And here's something pretty cool. My wife, she recently started gardening, and we've been able to use the dirt that Lomi produces to help fill the garden. And since I got my Lomi, I throw out way less garbage. That means it's not going to landfills and producing methane. Instead, I turn my waste into nutrient-rich dirt that I can feed to my plants. I feel so great knowing that I'm composting and creating soil instead of waste. And I have basically a limitless supply of dirt for my garden. The other week, I had my in-laws over for dinner, and the food cleanup process was such a breeze. Plus, they all think I'm super eco-conscious now. If you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just make cleanup after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash LegalAF and use the promo code LegalAF to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash LegalAF and use promo code LegalAF at checkout. Food waste is gross. Let Lomi save you a cold trip out to the garbage can. Let's stop cutting down trees to make toilet paper. It's true. Humans are cutting down tens of thousands every day just to supply the American need for toilet paper. And the worst part is that when we use trees for toilet paper, it's just one use and done. It obviously can't be recycled or reused, so it just goes straight into our water system. That's why I made the switch to real paper. Real is 100% bamboo, so we're using a plant that grows fast, can be harvested and regenerated like grass on a lawn. And it doesn't impact entire ecosystems of forests. Real is the best kind of eco-friendly product because it doesn't feel like you're sacrificing something to help the earth. In fact, it feels like an upgrade. It's always shipped free to my door in plastic-free packaging, and I can schedule it on a subscription so that it comes exactly when I need it. And I never have to worry about forgetting to buy any at the store. Real is now partnered with one tree planted. With every box of real that you buy, they are funding reforestation efforts across the country. So unlike the other TP that cuts down trees, Real is helping to actively plant them. I'm thrilled to have Real Paper as a sponsor to align my eco goals with a product that nature makes me use every day and to avoid further impact on the planet. Real Paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping in 100% recyclable plastic-free packaging. 
If you head to realpaper.com slash legal AF and sign up for a subscription using code legal AF at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R E E L P A P E R.com slash legal AF or enter promo code legal AF to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. Let's make a change for good this year and switch to real paper. Real is paper for the planet. I don't know when you do ads, Karen, but I'll be honest. Sometimes I get stuck on a word and I got to redo the thing like five times for whatever reason. And I'm reasonably fluent. I couldn't get subscription out. (laughs) And that had about five different times I needed to say that. So I won't even tell you how many takes that took to get that to get that right. Just it's amazing how your mind your mind takes over and plays tricks with you. Anyway, we we appreciate all of our sponsors. I really love both those sponsors. They really, the fact that one plants a tree and the other one prevents greenhouse gases. I mean, honestly, it just, I love that they're both so eco-friendly. It's really, they're really great products. It's the circle of life in two of two of our sponsors. <laughs> okay. Let's move on, on to um, why people come to this show, which is uh, hard hitting legal analysis and uh, occasionally a little bit of levity. Uh, but there's no levity in the E. Jean Carroll case because uh, the former treasonous president was found guilty of, uh, by a jury in New York of um, having sexually abused at least uh, E. Jean Carroll. It's a crime in New York. People might be wondering around the world. It wasn't a crime case, a criminal prosecution, because the statute of limitations, we're going to talk about statute of limitations in the second half of the show, in the next segment also, um, had run. And uh, there wasn't a way to kind of restart that particular clock. There was a way to restart the civil case uh, related to sexual abuse and sexual crimes. And so E. Jean Carroll rightly brought her case and the jury of her peers and Donald Trump's peers found uh, six men, three women, that she was sexually abused. Uh, New York is unique. There are most states out there that any part, anything that is placed inside of a woman against her will would be rape. In New York, if it's a finger and it's not your penis or the rapist penis or the person's penis, then it's not technically a rape. And that's what the jury had to conclude because E. Jean Carroll said that during the sexual attack that she suffered and she was a victim of, she couldn't tell whether it was Donald Trump's you-know-what or his finger. And so the jury was left to conclude, well, if she doesn't know, how are we supposed to know? We'll put it down for sexual abuse. That's not covering yourself in any glory. I wouldn't go to the rooftops and shout to the world, hooray, I've been vindicated. I'm just a sexual abuser, which is a crime in New York, not a rapist. But to Donald Trump, he was vindicated. That's the magical thinking that Ronnie Kaplan, lawyer for E. Jean Carroll, keeps talking about in her filings, that only in the perverse world of upside down world of Donald Trump does being found by a jury after a three week trial and and 12 witnesses against you and 71 exhibits and uh, pieces of evidence, you've been vindicated because you're just a sexual abuser. And now he's taken it one step further. He originally argued that that she couldn't amend her lawsuit because she did still have one pending lawsuit, the original E. Jean Carroll versus Donald Trump lawsuit, which we used to call Carroll Roman numeral one. Uh, That one was stayed for a while to see what would happen on the second case, Carol 2, which was based on defamatory statements that he made denying, not forget denying conduct or contact with her, denying knowing her and claiming that she was a hoax and a fraud and a shakedown artist and all of that. And the jury said, no, you knew her, you met her, you sexually abused her. And then by denying it, you ruined her professional reputation and otherwise, and you're going to pay punitive damages and actual damages of $5 million. So the case that was still remaining was about a defamation statements that he made when he was president, but they were able to amend it, the lawyers for E. Jean Carroll in federal court in New York, because two days or the day after, I think it was two days after the jury verdict, uh, the jury came back. He was at the CNN, now infamous CNN town hall, and he said the same thing. He said, I'm not, a, I, I didn't know her, it's a hoax, and all of that. And that, again, is defamatory because that's not what the trier of fact found in New York, whether that's judge or jury. They found that he was a sexual abuser. So now he's taken a new tact. He filed late last night a amended an answer and counterclaim. Now, let me just walk you through this. When there is a complaint, which is the operative pleading for the plaintiff, 
the thing that's filed to answer that complaint is called an answer. And in the answer, it really has three parts. It has the admissions or denials of the allegations of the complaint. It has the defenses, usually affirmative defenses, meaning the, de the defense has the affirmative burden of proof at trial to prove that element of a defense. Some defenses, they don't have the burden, and those are just kind of avoidance or regular defenses. And then there's the, then there's the um, affirmative defenses that have to be pled in federal court. Federal court's a notice pleading environment, so you just have to put a one-liner in there. You don't have to put the operative facts that support your defense. In state court practice, in some places, you have to put very elaborate um, factual support for whatever you're pleading. And then if you have a counterclaim against the party that has sued you, you bring it in that pleading. You may need permission first from the judge to do it, depending upon the procedural rules. And if you have a claim against somebody else that's not in the case, you can start what's called third party practice and you can bring in a, a cross claimant, a third party defendant, th and you can be the third party plaintiff. Have I lost everybody yet? In a case. And it all starts with when you file your answer. You have to make all of these decisions. Some of the claims you would bring against somebody are referred to as compulsory counterclaims because you have to bring them in your pleading or you have waived. And some of them are permissive counterclaims, meaning you can bring them here or you can start your own, your own case. And that, that has to go through on that. They already tried this counterclaim once before. When Joe Tacopina came in late to the case about three months before trial, taking over from Alina Haba, who had been running the case till, to date, he tried to bring the counterclaim. And the judge says, you're too late. Too late on counterclaims, that dead, that date and deadline passed. Now, Alina Haba, having shed Joe Tacopina, who lost the trial, she's now filing things on her own. And I've told people in my hot takes, when you see Alina Haba filing something, because she'll file anything, it's probably without merit. That's the only lawyer he can find to do it. And so she filed this amend, this uh, this uh, new counterclaim alleging he's been defamed, Donald Trump, because she... E. Jean Carroll on social media and interviews keeps calling him a rapist and he's not, follow this logic, he's not a rapist, he's a sexual abuser. And that's the defamation. Now, in order to do that, two things have to happen. One, you have to have a reputation that's capable of being defamed. And I'm not sure, I want to ask Karen your opinion in a minute. I'm not sure Donald Trump can be defamed. I'm not sure Jeffrey Dahmer can be defamed. I'm not sure Adolf Hitler can be de can be defamed. There are certain people that are beyond being defamed because their reputation is so crappy to begin with that there's nothing to defame. That's my one posit. The second one is you got to show damage. It, now if it's now if it's accusing you of a crime for which you're not committed, there's a measure in the law that's called defamation uh, per se. And you don't have to really show actual damage, but they're claiming actual damages, punitive damages, incalculable damages. I love that word. And my question is, then they would have to show that the damage between being a, to a reasonable jury, that there's a dollar amount between sexual abuser and rapist, that is, because that would be the measure of damage. And I don't know how you would ever calculate because both those things are so terrible that I, to the public and to a reasonable person's mind, it's a distinction without a difference. So again, a retaliatory case, like almost like a slap case against E. Jean Carroll by Alina Haba, setting themselves up for future sanctions. Karen, you, you saw it, you did a hot take with Ben. What, what did you make about all of it? What'd you make of it? Well, this this one makes my blood boil to no end. But before I do, you have to, you can't just say a slap case without explaining what a slap case is. Popak. Yes, it's just, it's just, well, see, just as I told you, I get tongue tied sometimes and must be the S's. It's a strategic lawsuit against something participation. It means you sue somebody because they've sued you and you're trying to stop them from suing you, not because there's merit, but because they'll have to deal with your retaliatory strike. And there's anti-slap uh, statutes on the books in New York that says you can't do that. So I'm sure we're gonna see Robbie Kaplan, the lawyer, arguing that this is nothing more than their attempt to chill 
her right to sue for the things that he did wrong with no real merit. And they're entitled to attorney's fees and damages as a result of that. I wouldn't tangle or tussle with Robbie Kaplan. You and I have had her on the show. And uh, Alina Haba is, I mean, this is, I, we, we talked about it. This is like Godzilla versus Bambi. And I mean that as a compliment, both to Godzilla and to Robbie Kaplan. Um, but we're going to see. And, and uh, Although federal- I, think, I, think, I think Alina Haba is the Godzilla because she's a monster. Well, she is a, a monster. She's a lawless monster right. who is willing to, you know, crush innocent civilians, you know, it, or at least attempt to in her wake. Uh, but so anyway, she is a complete monster. Yeah. And what do you, so um, what do you think is going to happen with this? What What do you think Judge Kaplan and knowing Alina Hobbs track record, she got sanctioned down in Florida, speaking of Florida, by Judge Middlebrooks for, for the suit that she filed with her name on it with Donald Trump against Hillary Clinton, the Democratic National Committee, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and everybody else for, for the big conspiracy of the Russia hoax. The judge said this was a political screed in search of a lawsuit without merit. And I'm going to sanction you the attorney's fees of the other side over a million dollars, Alina Haba and Donald Trump. So she's got a bad track record recently in federal court. What do you think Lewis Kaplan, who brooks no fools, who has already showed an interest in sanctioning and coming up with quick decisions. What do you think he does here? It's going to be a rule 11 sanction, right? Federal rule of civil procedure number 11 provides that a district court can sanction attorneys or parties who submit pleadings for an improper purpose or that contain frivolous arguments and or arguments that have no evidentiary support. I mean, that's, that's what the rule says. And I think he's going to slap a rule 11 sanction on her is, you know, faster than you can make someone's head spin. I think she's going to be sanctioned, uh, monetarily. And I also think he's going to refer her to the disciplinary committee because this woman shouldn't be practicing law. The fact that she that he she would give do a frivolous lawsuit like this that is not just frivolous it is absolutely cruel and it is inappropriate to use talk about weaponizing they are weaponizing the judicial system and going after e Jean carroll and you know look i'll agree that new york is completely backwards when it comes to the definition of rape uh, you know in in new york and and it's not every state the only way for there to be a rape is between a man and a woman and it and and it and it's a penis into a vagina and it has to be inserted okay that's it any other contact between you know if it's if it's two men you know and it's and it's penis to you know the backside that's not called rape. It's called something else. It's called criminal sexual act. But no one ever says, oh, I was criminally sexually acted, you know, or if somebody, if a man puts his penis forcibly into a woman's mouth, that's also, you can't use the word rape in New York. That's also called criminal sexual act. The only time it's actually technically called rape is penis to vagina. And so, and not, and, and it's kind of ridiculous, right? This is where it, you know, cause obviously it's, you you are raped. And so, and, and both in the legal sense, as well as in the colloquial sense. So, you know, the fact that New York has that that antiquated definition of that word, you know, is, is kind of ridiculous. And so I, there's no way there is, in no way, shape, or form can anyone argue with the fact that E. Jean Carroll was raped by Donald Trump, whether or not it was his penis. And, you know, what he took from her and what he did to her is what he does to women, right? And so for him, you know, what is he going to do? Is he going to sue the other two women who also testified at that trial and talked about how he forcibly groped them and, and what he did to them? You know, one of them in, in, in a library and the other one on an airplane. Is he going to sue them for defamation? too. You know, I mean, this is what this guy does, you know, and, and so I think it's kind of absolutely outrageous for him to, to make this claim and to say this to E. Jean Carroll. And I also have to say, you know, as a man, why is he advertising to the world that a jury that E. Jean Carroll couldn't tell the difference, couldn't feel the difference between his finger and his penis? <laughs> I, I'm just saying, like, you know, it seems like a little bit of a, you know, if I were I've him. I've always danced around that in hot takes, but but yes, it's not a, it's right. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't in want order to, for him to win. He's going to have to say, oh, yeah. she would have known the difference. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> this, so, so this, this one just, this is just, you know, she was absolutely sexually yeah. assaulted by this 
pervert who he's, you know, in that tape that was released the other night, you know, the, the, um, the tape at Bedminster, uh, mm -hmm. that's the feature of, of the indictment, the Mar-a-Lago indictment, you know, where he talks about Anthony Weiner, a pervert, uh, being a pervert. Okay. Pot calling the kettle black, you know, Donald Trump is the biggest pervert there is what he does to women. I mean, look at the three women who testified at this trial. Look at, you know, his comments on access Hollywood with grab him by the, you know what, like, so anyway, this, this, this one particular story makes me upset yeah. on behalf Understand of under, understandably uh, good. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I'm sorry. So, yeah. so, I don't know where I have no, my, my legal analysis has sort of gone out the window because I'm really kind of outraged. Um, anyway, so, well, let me ask you, let me ask you, let me get, let me get you just back for a second to the legal analysis part. Do you think I posited something? Can Donald Trump be defamed? Can Donald Trump, is he incapable of defamation, of being defamed, a victim of defamation because of his own reputation? Don't you have to have a, a, a unsullied reputation that can be defamed? Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. I, I think that's an excellent point. And on top of that, you know, look, he he has been fundraising off the back of this, right? His ratings in some ways have gone up amongst his followers. I don't understand it. So it's the opposite for him, you know, in his world, you know, saying things like, oh, you know, women like it when, when you grab them by the you know what, and, you know, him being this like, tough guy who sexually assaults women in his world, somehow that's like bravado. Th yeah. That is like makes him, you know, so, yeah. yeah. So it's like the opposite of defamation. This is, this is what, who he is and, and what people like about him. I think he gets more adulation, the more indicted he gets and the more he's accused of being a sexual abuser. And then I don't understand the damages here. This is why it's a slap case that's retaliatory and disgusting as you as you so eloquently put because i didn't really get the damages it, you know you can't jump up and down and tell the jury i'm not a rapist i'm a sexual abuser and that's impacted me dollar wise as far what, they're going to get an expert to say there is an economic difference between sexual abuse <laughs> being than a rapist I, the, this like you said she wasn't sexually uh, she wasn't uh whatever the the crime thing is called in new york you know She's allowed to say her version of what happened to her, and he's not allowed to, to deny it by saying that he was vindicated by the jury. Some people might be asking, what's going on with that appeal? Well, he posted his – Donald Trump had to put up a bond. We call it a supersedious bond. It stops the enforcement of the judgment for that moment of the appeal. could be a six-month to a year-long appeal. But it does guarantee that if he if the appeal is denied – Here's the, thank you, Salty. Here's the cashier's office receipt for the, we can talk a little bit about that. Yes, the clerk's office has a bank account and they take in and segregated funds, all of these kind of, when you want to pay into the court registry, you can always pay in plus, plus 10% the amount of the judgment against you and stop the enforcement of the judgment. Because if you don't stop the enforcement of the judgment, she has a judgment right now and she can go do post-judgment enforcement. She can go to banks, she can garnish wages, she can go grab money out of bank accounts. Wouldn't that be nice? She can go put a lien on buildings, anything that his property that's in his name, she can move to try to pierce the veil and try to get to his personal, you know, to his other assets that, that are not in his name and are, are in trusts, but she can't do any of it if the bond's been posted or the cash bond in this case has been posted. Now, whether he did it because he couldn't get a bonds comp a bondman. A yeah, bondsman, I was going to ask you about that. I Why did he know. post cash? Well, according he to Joe Tacopina in a text to the media, he said, bonds cost money. It's 110000 to keep a bond in place for two years. And so he's got the cash. That's my artist rendering. I don't that, know. You know I, think, I, think, close. I bet he couldn't get a bond. It might not be. Although bonds people, I mean, I, somebody would write that bond. I think they just had, I don't know why he wanted to tie up $5.5 million. But the good news for you, it's, it's not his money. All right. It's his money he's grifts off, to, off of his fundraiser. Yeah. I did a hot take care. where he's taking 10% of his presidential campaign fundraising money in tiny six point font that he changed in March that used to say 1%. When you donate to the presidential campaign of Donald Trump, 10% is going to Save America PAC, which he can use for his legal fees, which nobody knew and nobody read. And the New York Times, Maggie Haberman did a good job of finding that. You're right, it's not his money. So he's whipping it out of the 20 million that we think is left in Save America PAC and he's putting it over in the court in a, I'm not sure it's interest bearing, but the good news for E. Jean Carroll,
is that if the appeal ends at that level, either the first department court of appeals in New York, or then the subsequent court, which is the court of appeals in New York's the highest court in the state of New York. Um, Oh no, actually this is federal. I'm sorry. Second, forget all that stays in the pod. Second circuit (laughs) federal court appeal is the next level of appeal. And the only thing above that is the U S Supreme court. If she, if he loses at those levels, either because the Supreme court doesn't take it or he loses instantly that $5.5 million goes to E. Jean Carroll. And if there's not enough money in there, let's say this thing spins out another year, like two years, I think the court requires them to put in an extra interest. So she'll get her money faster because that cash is sitting in the bank. That's a good thing for E. Jean Carroll. And I think you're right, just to wrap up that one thing, and then we'll turn to Ivanka, is that um, uh, Lena Haba, get ready, you're getting sanctioned again. Apparently, this is how she's going to make a living. She's just going to go on Newsmax and say stupid things on Fox and try to grab other clients because her client base before wasn't that great. She operates Newsflash. She operates in New York out of a WeWork Regis near Penn Station. You know, she listed at 17th and 18th floor of East whatever street. And I looked it up and that's the Regis. So she's got a rent to office there for her New York stuff. Regularly, she's in Bedminster, New Jersey, right near the golf course, which is where she met Donald Trump. So it all comes full circle. Speaking of Trump and rounding out the show, Ivanka Trump got some good news. um, And we'll have to explain what it all means. Ivanka Trump and all the other Trumpers, including Donald Trump, had appealed Judge and Goron of the New York State Supreme Court's ruling uh, denying their motion to dismiss. They had argued to the trial judge that a lot of their claims or all of their claims were time barred, meaning the applicable six year statute of limitations for the New York Attorney General to bring a, an executive law 63 12 case, which is the special power, special superpowers that the New York Attorney General is given by the state legislature in order to stop continuing fraud in business practices, they can go into court and get all sorts of what we call equitable relief. Equitable relief stands in contrast to law relief, legal relief, which is uh, money damages and things like that. Equitable relief are injunctions and things called disgorgement, which people sometimes confuse with damages because it deals with money, but it's not damages. Damages are if I, if I would never do this to Karen, so I'm going to use somebody else. If I hit Ben's car <laughs> with, <laughs> with a fender bender, I backed up in his driveway and I hit whatever he's driving this day, his Kia, whatever he's driving. And I, and I did a thousand dollars worth of damage. That's a damage. And I owe him or my insurance company owes him a thousand bucks. That's legal damages, but that's not disgorgement. Disgorgement is, um, somebody, made money off of fraud and that calculated to a sum a sum certain right i made 50 million dollars drifting that money can be ripped away clawed back by somebody like the new york attorney general in a action called disgorgement which is a remedy an equitable remedy at at equity that the judge can enforce that rips away that money disgorging them of the ill-gotten gains it's and like asset you- forfeiture right it's it's it is a civil forfeiture, asset forfeiture, or other equitable remedies that are available there, and we often use that same term as you do in the RICO statute of ill-gotten gains. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's money that you got that you shouldn't have gotten because you got it on the back of a fraud. So the disgorgement case of um, of uh, uh, Letitia James, a New York Attorney General, which is set to go to trial on October second, is for two hundred and fifty million dollars. Where does that number come from? It comes from her calculation of a series of transactions that the Trump organization, led by Donald Trump and, and 17 others, including the Trump kids, executed, in which they tried to inflate the value of their real estate for some purposes, like when they needed a loan or they needed to uh, get insurance coverage, and then like a balloon, deflated it when they didn't want to pay as much on taxes. And they kept doing this, inflating and deflating based on whatever Donald Trump thought the value of these things were without using real appraisals. And that's a fraud. This is the argument. And therefore, she totaled up, you know, let's say 12 transactions and said they made they shouldn't have gotten this loan for 20 million. They shouldn't have gotten this loan for 100 million. They shouldn't have gotten this loan for 50 million. And she drew a line under it. And that's why we say it's a $250 million disgorgement case is what she's seeking. But now she's got a problem. 
Her problem is, and I want you to weigh in as a prosecutor, she had six year statute limitations. The courts are very consistent that there's a six year, not a three year statute of limitations in which to bring your case, use it or lose it. If you don't bring your case within a statute of limitations, whether it's a civil case between two parties, a criminal case, everything in the law has a statute of limitations attached to it. Almost everything. I mean, really everything. Sometimes that statute of limitations is told, T-O-L-L-E-D. Somebody puts a a hand on the clock and stops the clock for a period of time. Sometimes that's because something happened, like a fraud that wasn't discovered, and they give you a little bit more time to discover it, or because the parties enter into a tolling agreement, and therefore it gives the prosecutor or or the investigator more time in order to bring the case because the defense has agreed to it. And why does it, why does the defense uh, agree to it? They agree to it because they don't want to get prosecuted right away, and they want to play ball with the with the in this case the attorney general. But the 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 court here, which is the first department, the the uh, state court first level appellate department for Manhattan, ruled that everything related to Ivanka Trump that was in the pleading was filed late. It had to be filed by a date certain. And they were outside the six-year window when she filed her case in, I believe, in August of 2000, in 2022. And so she just missed it for Ivanka. As to the rest of them, including Donald Trump, she said, the, the, the appellate court said, most, if not all, of the transactions are within the statute of limitations. But Judge Angoron, here's the cutoff date we're going to give you. And you need to use that as a razor. And if any transactions fall on the wrong side of that date, you are, you are to remove them from the case before it goes to trial. And from what we can tell, there's two big transactions that are on the wrong side of the statute of limitations date. One of them is a big Florida uh, golf course uh, acquisition, and the other is a project in Chicago. So that if that's true, and that is, then the number from the 250 is going to get shrunk and, and you and I will have to calculate how much. Talk about it from a prosecutor standpoint. Why do you want a tolling agreement? And how did how did Letitia James, because she's done everything so right and so well, was this a screw up by her? Or did she always know that these dates, these transactions were going to fall off the time continuum against Ivanka Trump? Yeah. So look, statute of limitations exist, as you said, in civil and criminal cases. And, you know, some things have no statute of limitations, like murder, you know, has no statute of limitations. You can bring a murder case anytime you can solve it. But but there are other things that have shorter statutes of limitation in civil cases, uh, as well as criminal cases, because, you know, at a certain point, people have to be able to go on with their life and know that uh, that whatever it is was put behind them. And, you know, look, Ivanka, this was a rare win today in the in the Trump or yesterday in the Trump world where a Trump, Ivanka Trump, you know, she she won something, you know, it's on a technicality. It's not on the merits. But she did. She is now out of this case. And but statute of limitations are complicated, right? It's not, it's, it's sometimes it's as easy as, you know, here's six years is from six years from this date to this date, but sometimes there are times in between that are told. And so, for example, during this six year period, uh, what happened is we had the COVID-19, um, pandemic situation that caused governor, then governor Andrew Cuomo to issue a series of executive orders that told certain statute of limitations for a certain period of time. And it got a little complicated and a little confusing. And it even became confusing for prosecutors about was this time counted or not? They were not these straightforward starts and stops. They were these very complicated executive orders that kind of cobbled together uh, different time periods on and off for different things involving the courts and there were courts and there weren't courts. So in addition to the um, tolling agreement here, there was also that series of executive orders that she had to calculate. And look, not only did she get it wrong, Judge Angoran got it wrong because he ruled that this was within the, this is, don't forget, an in a, in a uh, an appeal from uh, one of his decisions saying that the statute, he calculated it the way uh, the way um, Attorney General Letitia James calculated it. And so what they did is uh, in, a, in a unanimous opinion, the appellate division first department, what they did was they said, no, when we 
add up the this time period and the executive orders and the tolling agreement, et cetera, uh, we find that it's actually this this period of time, not that period of time. And so, you know, look, this was a rare win for the biggest losers, you know, with the last name Trump, but it's a pretty big deal for Ivanka because it totally takes her out of uh, out of the mix here. But I suspect that that Tish James, you know, the attorney general, I, I suspect that this isn't a huge shock because if you recall, do you remember there was a time when uh, Judge Ngoron put the Trump organization and the individuals under a monitorship? Yeah. And she let her out. And All she right. let her out. So yeah. she was always on a different, she was always on a different track. I think they always had not I think they always kind of thought that they were pushing the envelope, but they, you know, weren't sure. And I think so. I don't think this was a huge sh shock for Tish James. I think, you know, she was just, it was an unclear area of the law, given all of the things we just talked about. And, you know, look, don't forget also this case had that companion criminal case, right? And for a long time, because don't forget, this is the identical case to the other Alvin Bragg case, the, the criminal investigation into the evaluation of assets, the one where as soon as Cy Vance uh, no longer was the district attorney, when when his term ran out and Alvin Bragg came in, uh, there he, an investigation was handed to Alvin Bragg and, and Alvin Bragg wasn't ready to go forward into the grand jury in the criminal part of this, but that was a joint investigation. And that's the one where the two prosecutors very noisily resigned. Um, and one of them wrote a book, et cetera. So that, you know, that this was always a side by side, uh, thing that they were doing together, a joint investigation. And so, you know, there was a lot of, how do you do that? What's more important, a criminal case or a civil case? And so, you know, a lot of times uh, the attorney general or a civil case will defer to the criminal case, right? And let the criminal case go forward. And so some time was potentially, and I don't know this, but I'm guessing some time was eaten up by allowing that case to proceed. So, you know, it's just one of those things that happens, but she has, you know, she she's off the case and now they're going to focus on, uh, on just the men on, you know, the, 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 the boys and, and Donald and, you know, the trial's supposed to happen in October. Hopefully it still will, but you know, that's, that's how I see this Popak. What about you? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that, uh, it's a rare win, uh, shout out where shout outs are due. Bennett Moskowitz, the new lawyer for, at, at uh, Troutman Sanders, uh, or whatever the firm is now that they merged with a few other firms for for Ivanka came in a little bit later did a good job. Um, the good news is that the appellate court reinforced the appropriate for the rest of the world reinforced the appropriate statute of limitations being six years in all cases involving sixty three dash twelve. So it reinforced the power the superpower of the attorney general. But Ivanka, you know the cutoff for those that are playing at home playing the legal AF home game, the date. Um, that all of the transactions needed to be within had to be July 20, uh, for her, sorry, February 2016, six years, meaning they had a file by, Feb by February 2022. And this case wasn't filed till September 2022. Just missed it. For the Trump organization, the, uh, the applicable operative date is July of 2014. So there's definitely things that are after that and cut off that are going to have to come off the board for Letitia James. So maybe it cuts the 250 in half. I'm not sure. But it doesn't change, I think, the case going forward on, on October the 2nd. Uh, it'll be whittled down a bit. Ivanka won't be won't be there. Um, but, you know, the, also I think the Letitia has to make the decision whether she's going to take an appeal herself to the Court of Appeals and delay the trial or she's going to, like you said, sort of saw the writing was on the wall for Ivanka early on and is just going to let her take a pass without taking the appeal. The uh, Of course, the two sides already issued their statements. Uh, Chris Keis, who's the lawyer for Donald Trump down in Florida for the criminal case, said, see, we told you the New York Attorney General's case is out of control and eventually uh, Donald Trump will be proven to be the amazing business person and successful business person that he always was. And there's no victims here. Neither the banks nor the insurance companies were victims and we will prevail. To which Letitia James on the other side, her office said there is a mountain, this is her quote, mm -hmm. a mountain of evidence against Donald Trump that we will be using 
you know, so, you know, too bad, so sad about Ivanka. This is my words, but we have a mountain of evidence against Donald Trump. We'll see you in court. But she didn't make it. She didn't say whether she was going to appeal or not. Do you think they're going to appeal to the highest level court in New York? Do you think they just kind of take their long move on and move on? Yeah, but I mean, because don't forget, this wasn't just a motion uh, regarding the statute of limitations. This was also a much bigger motion that was made uh, challenging the use of that statute, et cetera. And and Trump's all, lost all on all of that, you know. So this wasn't a win, right? This. This was a win for Ivanka because because the case is dismissed on a technicality. But this wasn't a win for the rest of the Trumps. This was an, an no. affirmation, actually, that this is a uh, a valid case, a righteous case, a valid application of the law. And you know, look, she knows, and everybody knows, delay is the tactic. So if I were her, I'd want a trial. You know, we got an October date. That's before you know all the other. We have Jack Smith asking for December. We have Alvin Bragg uh, doing his case March. in March. I'd say let's go, and I I would take my time and my trial, and I would just do it because otherwise you risk not having a trial with. Agreed, Trump. and and she she you and I have already commented that Letitia's been on other podcasts, and has said that she thinks that her trial date may be in jeopardy. But that was before this sort of fast cannon thing happened, and now the parties are going to have a tussle with Cannon in the middle of July or the middle of the end of July about um, when is the appropriate trial date? Should it be December around my birthday or should it be at some other time after he is a failed presidential candidate for the second time? I don't know which one it is, but, uh, you know, we'll we'll follow this really fascinating stuff. I always, you know, I'm always a little bit um, melancholy at the end of our podcast because I could go on forever. And I know we, we missed a, the topic. Oh crap! What was the topic we missed? We were going to talk about the Hellerstein brag. Uh, oh, let's do it. Yes. Okay. So good. All right. You know what? I get sometimes I get caught up in the world of did we do that already in the hot take and you did it with Ben. All right. You're right. People come to the podcast and the audio version to get the law. So here we go. A couple of weeks ago, you and I had a conversation about a pending a pending decision being made by the federal judge as to whether Judge Hellerstein, senior status in the Southern District of New York, on a petition to remove the Manhattan DA's prosecution in front of Judge Juan Mershon, former colleague of yours, uh, in the uh, Manhattan DA's office, along with Jack Smith, and whether he was going to still be the judge or it was going to be presided over by a federal judge and a federal jury. Same prosecutor state, same laws state, but new courthouse because, I don't know, Donald Trump likes to delay things and go into federal court. He's doing terribly in federal court. I don't know why he wants to be there, but he wants to get away from Judge Juan Rashad and his $35 donation to the Biden campaign um, because, you know, it gives him political fodder uh, to attack and, and raise money. And so there was a very healthy series of briefing. You and I, I was, you and I were on away when that started. I was in my place, you were in your place. And the E. Jean, just tell you how far away that was back in May, E. Jean Carroll had just come down with a verdict uh, and a judgment. And we got, oh, they filed a motion to remove. Now Hellerstein has let it be fully briefed and he had a two hour hearing. And he was none too kind to the arguments of Todd Blanche, the other, the other criminal lawyer down in Florida for Donald Trump, just to keep things straight, about why can't the state court judge preside over this and why only a federal judge can give you justice in this case? I don't see it. What did you, I mean, basically, I mean, you, you, tell, the, you tell the audience, we know what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next? Well, the judge signaled to the parties uh, he's, what, he's, uh, what he's going to do. He said, you know, orally, he said, look, I'm going to write on this uh, and I'm going to write a decision about my legal reasoning about this removal question. But and I'm going to do it very soon. But my very strong inclination is to remand this back to state court. This is my strong uh, inclination. It's not binding. And, you know, what he said was, look, there's no reason to believe that measured justice can't occur in state court. You know, he really signaled to the parties that it's going to stay there. And, you know, I want to give you credit. You predicted this. You know, you said, uh, yes, this is this is going to happen. I was a little bit I said, look, you know, I, I wasn't sure because, uh, you know, I was I was at the DA's office when we, you know, when when we watched, um, you know, when we when we were uh, subpoenaing uh, Trump's 
tax returns, not from him, but from Mazars, his accounting firm. And that went all the way up to the Supreme Court and back and went in, he got that removed. They got that removed to federal court, even though none of us thought that would go to federal court, we thought it would stay in the state. And don't forget once those tax returns returns were um, obtained, that, that was the basis for the 17 count conviction of the Trump organization that happened uh, happened last year. Anyway, so I thought, look, if they did it there, they could do it here. I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't sure one way or the other which way it would go, but that, you know, look, that this could happen. And, you know, and so, you know, it was one of those things that could, I thought could go either way, um, you know, because Trump is trying to get Mershon off the case. You know, he thinks he's biased against him for the reasons you said, you know, but I think what, what Judge Hellerstein was saying is he can get a fair trial in, in, um, in the state. And I think that was partly because, you know, it's a, a non to Judge Mershon, who's really an excellent, an excellent uh, judge and has a great reputation. So the other, look, the other thing too is the standard for removal that Trump would have to use is, you know, um, it's under, it's called federal officer removal. And that's the ground to, grounds that um, the, the law that would be used to remove a matter from state court and bring it to federal court. And it's very narrow, you know, the, the first of all, the person has to be a federal officer and it, Normally, either it's about charges or conduct that arose under the color of their office and that there's a viable defense or that there's a viable federal defense. And I thought, you know, look, this happened. Donald Trump wrote the checks while he was president. And of course, he's a federal officer. He's the president. And so that's why I thought potentially um, this could be removed. But the Manhattan DA's office in their brief did something brilliant. And I love, love when people do this is they cited to Trump's own words in his brief as to a reason why this was not grounds for federal removal. Because don't forget, in Trump's own brief, what they said was, look, you know, this um, Michael, this, you know, Michael Cohen um, was hired to help Trump in his personal affairs, right? He, because they're trying to, they're trying to have it both ways. They don't want this to have affected the election because if they did this to affect the election, then he's guilty. Or, or if nothing else, just guilty of a misdemeanor. What makes it a felony is, you know, if it's if it's for another crime and if it could be for an election crime. But he's saying, no, this had nothing to do with the election. I hired Michael Cohen for my personal affairs, right? This was he's my personal lawyer for my personal affairs and it was separate apart from my presidency. And that's that's Donald Trump's entire argument and his entire defense in this case. So the DA's office used that in in their papers to say to judge hellerstein look a federal the federal officer removal the grounds for grounds for removal it requires that th this to be conduct arising under the color of their federal office and trump in his own words is saying no this is personal so i think that alone his Trump's own words defeats his removal. And, um, and so I think it's not going to be uh, removed, but we'll mm -hmm. see. We'll see soon in writing. Yeah, I think, I think it stays in state court. And again, just to square the circle here, the reason that Donald Trump probably wanted to make it go to federal court, not, as, not because he loved Judge Hellerstein. In fact, that was the, probably the last person he wanted to see randomly assigned to the case, a Clinton appointee. Um, we'll put up his picture later, who looks like Yoda in a 10-gallon hat. That's not the one. There we go. Uh, that's not the judge they wanted to pull, um, who's ruled in favor of Michael Cohen and against Donald Trump in the department uh, of uh, and uh, Bill Barr in the past um, in, in a retaliation case that Michael Cohen made to be released from uh, lockup um, uh, after he was sent back in retaliation for social media postings. That's not the judge they wanted. Why? Because at least in the Southern District of New York, there's a couple of counties that, that contribute jurors that are more conservative Republican than just the jury pool for Manhattan. Manhattan jury pool other than a couple of places on the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side, uh, is you know pretty blue. Uh, you know, it, it ranges from uh, from dark deep blue to dark blue to blue. Um, you know, with a couple of little pockets here and there, and so they didn't like that, and they already saw how that worked for them because same judge, same DA a year ago, same same lawyers, except for uh, Todd Blanche being added to the team, lost seventeen count. Uh, jury verdict uh, for business fraud and tax fraud related to uh, the two Trump organizations. And uh, 
So they 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 already saw that. You know, they had that movie, that dress rehearsal. That went terribly. They don't want to do that again. Maybe they could, oh, maybe we can get Ulster County and Orange County and this county and that county and Westchester County. We'll get a couple of Trumpers on there and we'll be able to hang the jury or, or get a, a verdict. You know, they won't be able to convict. So that's where they were going. Not happening. Going back, it's almost, as far as I know, it's almost impossible to appeal that. And so we're full steam ahead because Judge Hellerstein and his and his orders, you know, three weeks ago when he was setting the briefing schedule was like, yeah, in the meantime, Judge Mershon, you got this. You do you. You keep setting hearings and things. And we'll get back to you on whether I'm ever going to take the case away from you. And it looks like he's not going to be doing that. Um, I could go on with you, Karen, for a long, long time. But unfortunately, we've reached the end. Or fortunately, we've reached the end of another episode of the midweek edition of Legal AF. You can only get it on the Midas Touch Network. And you can do it in several different ways. We have different different uh, delivery devices for the analysis and news that we do. And they are all tied to the Midas Touch Network. You can subscribe on YouTube, where people are watching us tonight. We're often the first or second most watched show on YouTube Live in the world. We were just beat last week. We came in number two during our live taping, our live recording, only by Donald Trump doing some crappy thing in front of fundamentalist Christians. Other than that, we were the number, we were the number one show. Um, so that's one way to get it. That's one delivery device. You can then also, um, and that you can subscribe for free, all free. Everything I'm going to talk about now is free on the to the you might as touch uh network on their youtube channel you can also then go over to the audio and you know in a few hours we're going to drop the audio version of this on literally every known platform for podcasting out there we are there and we're easy to find and you can plus follow subscribe for free like us and comment on us there and it helps if you do both to be honest you know, we, we pack a lot into this show. So a lot of people like to, with a little more time, a little more leisurely, walking the dog, doing errands, housekeeping, working, whatever, listening to the show. That helps. Both help. Watching, listening, help. Commenting, thumbs upping helps with the algorithms, if you can believe it. And so that's why I say it. And then you can, you know, you can go to our merchandise store where we have some merchandise. We haven't gotten the, the KFA collection fully ready yet, but we will before the summer's over. But you can go to the uh, Midas Touch store dot Midas Touch dot com. I always blow that. Uh, and you can get legal AF gear, including um, I think you still have uh, coffee mugs as well, which I, I like and I hand out to people that I know. And um and that's that's how you can support the show. A lot of people are like, "How do we? How can we support you and support our sponsors?" I know the sponsors on every podcast. It's controversial that we that we have we have to pay bills for the podcast, but we do, and we like our sponsors, and we curate them, and we pick ones that we can support and that want to support what we're doing, the mission that we have at the intersection of law and politics, and they're supportive of it. And you should be supportive of them too, because it helps keep this show coming to you uninterrupted, if you will, you know, week after week after week and all the hot takes that we do as well throughout the week. If you add it all up, you're looking at, you know, I mean, literally, if you add up all the hot takes that are legal oriented between Ben, me, and Karen, you're looking at, I don't know, 20 hours plus, you know, 24 hours of material a week, right? If you add it all up and that's what you should do. And then we take some of the better podcast, some of the better YouTube things, we put them over on the podcast so you can grab it there in little short bites or the people that are committed to our long, our long show format like this one. So that's, that's the promo for the show. We got to do that every week. Got bills to pay, got salties to pay. Uh, but Karen, you've, <laughs> You, you've been jumping into the hot takes lately. You've been doing a great job with those as well, along with your commentary on a network that I will not name out loud, but is real, reasonably popular and well-known <laughs> and has been helping deliver real real news lately, which I really like involving Donald Trump. I'll give you the last word. Go ahead. The, the last word this week is, thank God the Popak beard is back. I was really thrown last week, Popak. It just... You know, I'm used to a certain thing and it really threw me off. So I'm a it's fan. It's back from its vacation. The, the beard back is back from, from its vacation. vacation. So, anyway, <laughs> that, that's, I just want to say I, I'm really, I, I was feeling a little unsettled last week. It was a little jarring. So I feel much better this week. So. I came out of the bathroom. The family was like, what happens? Did something happen in there? Like, no, I just, 
needed to see my face occasionally. But all right, let's not, we won't, we won't make the show about what you and I look like. You always look great, of course, whether you're here, Law and Order set as a legal advisor for Law and Order, doing a plug, uh, CNN as a regular contributor, but it all started. Where did it start, Karen? On a street corner in Manhattan. (laughs) That sounds so, I love that. That Where we were measuring. We were measuring the decibels of a, <laughs> you know, of a building, you know, that was going up and it was That's interfering. So film with- noir, right? Isn't that, aren't yeah. you picturing like a gray, black and white set and like smoke at the bottom and I'm wearing a fedora and you're yeah. there, whatever you're and we're just having a conversation about, you know, what do you, what about me? What about you joining? Yes. Yeah. What about you? This sounds fantastic. Exactly. Let's start doing it on Wednesdays. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. And that, that's how we got here. So yeah. I really appreciate you reminding everybody how we got here. Uh, we're going to end the show. Shout out to the Midas Mighty and the Legal AFers. We'll see you next week. See you on Saturday with Ben Mycellus for the Weekend Show. 